Hello, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time zone we're in. So thank you, thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak at your conference. I know that there have been a lot of murmurs about what it means for someone who's quite critical, who's been quite critical of the Horizon Re um, Report project to come and speak at the conference, not just that, but sort of deliver the closing remarks. So um, I will say at the outset that I am not here to offer solutions or resolutions or absolutions. Um, the latter is the job of your priest. None of these are the job of a keynote speaker. I will not be assigning penance today, although as a scholar of history and culture, I do want all of you, all of us, really, to think about what we've done, right? to think about what we've said, to think about the stories that we tell about the future of technology and education. And that's the purpose of the Horizon Report, of course. It's a story about the future. Right? It's a story designed to share, one you can tell others. And like certain genres of storytelling, it's particularly well-suited for urging people to behave in certain ways. It's one that aspires to shape the future in certain directions. Or in the seasonally inappropriate words of John Frederick Coots and Haven Gillespie, you better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why. Artificial intelligence is four to five years on the horizon. It's the verse we don't often sing. Um, I, I spend a lot of time talking about what I call the history of the future of education technology. I'm interested in the stories we tell and the stories that we've long told about the shape of things to come. That is to say, the shape of things we believe, we hope, we imagine, we worry, we predict will come. I'm interested in how technology functions in those stories, right? As a motif, as a symbol, as a theme sometimes even as a protagonist right, in its own right. I'm interested in how technology functions in these stories as a set of imagined practices, a reflection of a certain mindset, one that's always bound up in the speaker's own time and place. I'm interested in what we believe technology will do, right? why we believe technology will work and why technology is featured so prominently in the stories we tell about the future. Why and where. So I realize this is an education conference, but I want to shift the where of my focus today to stories about the future of technology that take place outside the school, outside the classroom. I want to talk about the history of the future of technologies of the home. And my, my rationale is, is several fold. First, Education technology is boring. <laughs> or at least its stories are really repetitive, right? You've sat here through a couple of days now of presentations worth of, you know, on ed tech, and, and perhaps you're a little tired of it too. Maybe I'm projecting. <laughs> um, but to borrow from Norman's law of e-learning tool convergence, um, no matter the stories we tell about innovation, or no matter the predictions that we make about disruption, um, <laughs> in time, every story we tell about ed tech seems to involve or become the learning management system. Right? And I don't want to talk about the LMS. Not now, not today, frankly, not ever. Right? I don't want to talk about it as a portal or a personalized learning environment or a next generation learning environment. I don't want to talk about it as infrastructure or as ideology or as a conduit of our failed imagination, although it's all those things. Second, I want to talk about the future of technology of the home because I want us to talk about the history of consumer products. Right? In many ways, education technology has been much more closely associated with what people call enterprise technology, right? That's sort of largely administrative software that gets sold to large organizations, the government, big corporations, K through 12 school districts, universities. But it's deeply intertwined with consumer tech and trends. I'm not sure those of us in education technology want to talk about that consumer framework. Right? We like to pretend that we use technology 
to improve teaching and learning, not because we've been heavily marketed certain products and certain stories about the necessity of our technological consumption. We prefer to think of ourselves as professors and pedagogues and scholars and students, not consumers and not users. Right? But no doubt, techno today's technology companies sees students, sees schools as an untapped market. That's not new. Technology companies, particularly those hawking aspirational education-related products, have long viewed parents in a similar way. But now, software is eating the world, venture capitalist Mark Andreessen wants us to believe. Right? Software is eating the world. In my mind, when I hear that, I hear this idea of Silicon Valley ideology, sort of this libertarian, consumerist, capitalist model that really wants to mediate all of our relationships, right? Personal, social, professional, civic, familial. So I want to talk about technologies of the home, the social and the economic history. What do we expect technology of the home to do? How does this technology actually function? Who does it benefit? What does it signal? Whose values, whose imagination does it reflect? Who builds it? Who buys it? Whose home is this technological imaginary that we're supposed to tout? Side note. Someone from the Clayton Christensen Institute recently invoked the history of household appliances in an op-ed for EdSurge. Ed and they asked, is your EdTech product a refrigerator or washing machine? And these two appliances are, I think, meant to serve in the article as an, analog as an analogy for EdTech adoption, right? Something about how quickly we embrace products that fit in the home as is compared to those that require we restructure entire rooms, lay new pipes, right? Incrementalism versus transformation, I suppose, or reform versus revolution. The historical timeline in the op-ed is a little off. The um, historian of technology, Jonathan Reese, has pointed out, noting that many of us do get by just fine without having washing machines in our home. New technology replacing and displacing and disrupting old technology is not inevitable, no matter how many times folks from the Clayton Christensen Institute tell us that story. A side note to the side note, there was a press release um, last month that pronounced, and I'll quote, global innovation guru Clay Christensen predicts disruption in the domain of parenting. <laughs> pay attention, pay attention to these stories, right? Pay attention to these storytellers. Pay critical attention, right? Ask better questions about why they're inventing these histories and why they're predicting these futures. So the third reason, remember I'm giving a list. The third reason I want to talk about technology in the home is I want us to think about technology and labor. About the home as a site of production and reproduction. And yes, I mean that in a Marxist sense. I know you're not supposed to say Marx in a room full of instructional technologists, but I just did, whatever, I'm on stage, you can't stop me. Particularly the production and reproduction of knowledge and culture, right? And I want us to think about love and care, affective labor, emotional labor. Who do we imagine is doing this work? and Do we value it? So my aim here is to sort of defamiliarize a discussion of education technology. I want us to slip, slip, shift the focus just slightly so that we can perceive it a little bit differently. And I want to explore with you the technologies of child rearing, new and old. And I want you to think, as I do at every turn, about how these technologies and how these practices and how these stories are prescribed for the home and for the schoolhouse, right? Or at least for some homes and certain classrooms. So in January of this year, at the annual Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, Mattel, or at least its subsidiary, Nobby, unveiled Aristotle, a smart baby monitor. What it claimed was the world's first. Companies always hope that they can get headlines out of CES, and Aristotle received 
a fair amount of tension this year. There were stories in the usual tech publications, in Gadget, PC World, CNET, as well as the mainstream and tabloid press, USA Today, ABC News, Fox News, the Daily Mail. Bloomberg heralded the device as, quote, baby's first virtual assistant. And here's how Fast Company described the voice-activated speaker slash monitor, which is set to launch sometime next month, but they keep pushing the release date back, so maybe it's not a thing. Aristotle is built to live in a child's room and answer a child's question. In the most intimate of spaces, Aristotle is designed to be far more specific than the generic voice assistance of today, a nanny, a friend, a tutor, equally able to soothe a newborn and aid a tween with foreign language homework. It's an AI to help raise your child. And that is obviously a series of sentences that situates the device among its competitors, right, today, those generic voice assistants, but it also serves as this sort of very imaginative marketing of a certain technological future, right? One where a machine can actually aid a tween with foreign language homework. It's not a list of actual technical specifications. Indeed, since CES in January, those specifications for the device have changed substantially. Mattel has canceled the integration with Amazon Alexa, for example, which was supposed to power the speaker and provide those parts of parent mode that involved ordering baby supplies. So here's how the Mattel website today, where you can pre-order the device, should you so desire, now describes the features. Aristotle, trademark, combines multiple nursery devices into one convenient, hands-free system. It is a smart baby monitor, multicolor LED nightlight, Wi-Fi HD camera, Bluetooth speaker, and sound machine all in one exclamation point. The convenient Aristotle app lets you keep a close eye and ear on your baby from your smart device via Wi-Fi internet connection, easily track and store your baby's feedings, changing and sleeping patterns, receive notifications to alert you of important reminders in real time. You can even find out if your little one is fussy with the cry detector, exclamation point. With the app's Do This When tool, you can create customized actions to respond automatically to your baby. For example, you can program Aristotle to respond to your baby's cries with a personalized soothing light and sound combination. There's a lot packed into that marketing material, not just about the specifics of the device for sale, but about these sort of cultural and commercial expectations of parenting. And it's also a lot of buzzwords that might be familiar to those of us who work in education technology, right? Personalization, analytics, real-time notifications, convenience. But gone from Mattel's website now are all these boasts that they made at CES about one of what the executive said was the fundamental problem with baby products, which is they don't grow with you. Aristotle was couched at CES as a virtual assistant that would offer, if not lifelong learning, then this sort of AI that would grow and learn about the child and teach her as she grew into a teen. All of those promises that this $350 device would be something that parents would keep in the room long after they didn't really need a baby monitor, those are nowhere to be found. For, um, what remains is sort of some fairly typical boilerplate language about an internet connected device. What happened? Did they promise too much? Did the marketing actually make people freak out? I, I think it's, you know, let's be clear that the gulf between marketing's promise and technological c capabilities and consumers' interests and desires that gulf appears regularly, right? Think about the repeated failures of VR and AI to live up to the hype. But the hype, wow, the hype. 
to give you a flavor of what the company executives and in return technology reporters gushed about at CES, here's more from Fast Company. And I'm sorry, I'm going to quote it at length. But I was just amazed at how swept away technology reporters were about this future of high-tech dystopian parenting, right? It's the child to Aristotle connection that makes the device such an interesting entrant in the rapidly commoditized voice assistant market. Key to that is Aristotle's ability to understand young voices. Quote, it was one of the core things we tried to resolve from the get-go, said one executive. Our audience often says words completely differently. To deal with that complication, Mattel partnered with Polstring, a San Francisco-based company that focuses on AI conversation and speech recognition. Embedded with Polstring, Polstring's platform, Aristotle will mature along with its young listeners, constantly improving its recognition capabilities as children get older. For toddlers, Aristotle will turn its LED various colors and ask the listener to identify them. Older kids can ask Aristotle factoids like, who was the 16th president of the United States? Or a request to play a game. All of this points to Aristotle's greater intent. It's built for play. Mattel is, after all, a toy company with lots of intellectual property. Imagine what happens with Hot Wheels and Thomas the Tank Engine when you have this connected hub, one of the executives said. Do you hear sound effects? Can you have greater interaction? Mattel imagines that even cheap, simplistic, die-cast cars can be loaded with computer chips to connect to Aristotle. Meanwhile, the device's camera will have object recognition to identify flashcards and even a toy without any electronics. Sad tear. Who has that? Essentially adding interactions to make it more dynamic. The company is aiming to roll out these features early next year. I mean, I guess, right? If any of this particular techno fantasy comes true, we shall see, let alone early next year. We, the reader and the consumer, are expected to believe a lot of bullshit in those three paragraphs, right? That the device works that AI learns, that quizzing children on factoids is a technological or pedagogical breakthrough, right? And that this is the future of play. Mattel is already selling an, interconnect, an internet connected Barbie, hello Barbie, and an interconne internet connected Barbie dream house. Uh, much to the consternation of privacy and information security experts who caution that these devices are incredibly insecure and that the microphone and stored audio files are easily hackable. Incidentally, the, the, the uh, two Barbie toys use the same voice recognition technology as Aristotle Toy Talk, in case you've seen headlines about it, which rebranded as Polstring. Perhaps we might recognize, as we wait to see if Mattel's predictions or Clay Christensen's predictions come true, that the fantasy about the robot companions and robot caretakers has its own long history. Stories that elicit fear, oftentimes. There is Olympia in E.T.A. Hoffman's 1816 short story, The Sandman, for example which Sigmund Freud uses the basis for his analysis of the uncanny. Right? That unsettling feeling of something strangely and frighteningly familiar. Das und Heimlich, Freud observed. It's a German word that contains in it this ambivalence. Heimlich, meaning home, meaning something familiar, but also something, something hidden. And unheimlich, the unspoken, the repressed. The robot is uncanny to us. Or the seemingly living doll in that short story, right? The automaton. These all veer towards das und Heimlich, making the familiar unfamiliar. This is the basis for horror stories. And yet, at CES and elsewhere, technologists insist that this is what we will want in the home. 
incidentally, this is why a liberal arts degree matters, technologists, right? So that you actually are like, no, I read that in a short story, and that is a bad idea. <laughs> so the difference between the PE, PR at CES in January and the marketing material on the Mattel website in June might be striking, but it's not surprising. The point of CES, after all, is not to showcase what technology can do, but to suggest what it might be able to do. Each and every year, the event is full of promises and vaporware, right? Prototypes that never make it into production. Products that never make it onto the store shelves. CES really encapsulates what I've argued elsewhere, that the best way to predict the future is to issue a press release. When you can tell a powerful story about what's on the horizon in order to help shape imaginations and markets. Imaginations and markets. So what stories, what forces help shape the markets for baby monitors? Baby monitors have a history, of course, a social history, a history of the technology. We did not need baby monitors, need baby monitors, until quite recently. Right? In no small part because our current system of sleeping, adults in one room, children in a separate room, did not exist before the late 19th century. And the idea that babies would sleep alone is even newer, reinforced by the rise of disciplines in the earliest 20th century of psychology and pediatrics, along with the market for parenting books and child-rearing products that accompanied the science. The first baby monitor, the radio nurse, was built by Zenith Radio Corporation in 1937. Zenith's president, Eugene F. McDonald Jr., had cobbled together his own experimental system for his yacht, using what was already a popular and accessible technology of the time, radio broadcasting. Uh, Zenith engineers polished the prototype into this two-piece set. The guardian ear on the left, uh, which was plugged in next to the baby's crib, this transmitted sounds, and the radio nurse, the object in the middle, which was plugged in next to the listening caregiver that received them. Uh, Asamu Noguchi, a well-known Japanese-American sculptor, was commissioned to design the latter, something he made out of Bakelite, which according to the curator of the Henry Ford Museum was, quote, an impressive abstract form that managed to capture the essence of a benign, yet no-nonsense, nurse. <laughs> the essence of a nurse, a curved plastic box. Das Unheimlich, right? <laughs> the radio nurse was never a commercial success. The monitor actually picked up all the radio broadcasts in the area, <laughs> not just those coming from the baby's room, but nevertheless, the baby monitor has since become a consumer product that parents are now expected to own, right? often justified as a medical precaution, even though there's no evidence that these devices or prevent or even reduce sudden infant death syndrome. Interestingly, infant mortality was not the inspiration for the radio nurse, or, or so the story goes. Zenith's president felt compelled to build a monitor for his own child following the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby in 1932. Okay. So the crime of the century and its trial were covered extensively by newsreels. The kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby really shaped Americans' imaginations. It prompted the passage of several laws relating to abduction. I don't want to overstate the importance of that particular crime in fostering the notion that babies need monitoring. Right, particularly in, light of, in the early 20th century, there were many, many reforms, efforts made to protect children's safety and well-being in the early 20th century. But I think we can see in the radio nurse this technological intervention, right? This embrace of a popular story that children are in danger, that they need to be surveilled when they are out of our sight for their own protection, and it's a really early embrace of a story that parenting can be mechanized, right? For the sake of progress, the 20th century demands it. 
Now, <laughs> I would be remiss if I neglected in an education technology conference to talk about one of the most controversial parenting machines of the 20th century, the Air Crib, designed by behavioral psychologist B.F. Skinner, infamous trainer of pigeons and inventor of teaching machines, first called the baby tender, and then I, I kid you not, the air conditioner, right, H-E-I-R. No, I know, Harvard psychologists need to get out more. They are unfunny people. Um, <laughs> the device was meant to replace the crib, the bassinet, and the playpen. You can actually, there's echoes of this efficiency in Mattel's Aristotle, right? Multiple nursery devices in one convenient hands-free system. Skinner fabricated this climate-controlled environment for his second child in 1944. He wrote in Ladies Home Journal the following year, he said, when we decided to have another child, my wife and I felt it was time to apply a little labor-saving invention and design to the problems of the nursery. We began by going over the disheartening schedule of the young mother step by step. We asked only one question. Is this practice important for the physical and psychological health of the baby? When it was not, we marked it for elimination. Then the gadgeteering began. The crib that Skinner gadgeteered for his daughter was made of metal, larger than a typical crib, higher off the ground, you labor saving because you didn't have to bend over as much, Skinner argued. It had three solid walls, a roof, a safety glass pane at the front which could be lowered to move the baby in and out. Canvas was stretched across the bottom to create the floor. Um, the bedding was stored on a spool outside that could be rolled in to replace soiled linen. It was soundproof and dirt proof. Skinner said, but the key feature was that it was temperature controlled. So save the diaper, the baby was kept unclothed and unbundled. Skinner argued that again, clothing creates unnecessary laundry, but it inhibits the baby's movement and then hurts the baby's exploration of the world. As a labor saving machine, Skinner boasted that the air crib meant it would only take, quote, about one and one half hours each day to feed change and care for the baby. Awesome. Just stick it in there, right? Skinner insisted, though, that his daughter, who stayed in the crib for the first two years of her life, was not socially starved or robbed of affection and mother love. He wrote in Ladies Home Journal that the compartment does not ostracize the baby. The large window is no more of a barrier than the bars of a crib. The baby follows what is going on in the room, smiles, smiles at passerby, plays peekaboo games, and obviously delights in company. And she is handled, talked to, and played with when she's changed or fed. And each afternoon during a play period, which are becoming longer as she grows older. Much like the radio nurse, the air crib did not catch on. <laughs> Quite possibly because of that very Ladies Home Journal article, its title, Baby in a Box, connected the crib to the Skinner's box, right? The operant conditioning chamber that Skinner had designed for his experiments on rats and pigeons, sort of associating the crib with the rewards and pellets that Skinner used to modify these animals' behavior in the lab. And indeed, the article described the crib and the practices that he and his wife developed for their daughter as an experiment, a word that he probably didn't mean in the scientific sense, but probably meant for readers that they were thinking that this was a piece of lab equipment, not necessarily a piece of furniture suitable for the home or for a baby. And the article opened with the phrase, in that brave new world which science is preparing for the housewife of the future. And many readers were probably familiar with Aldous Huxley's 1932 novel, Brave New World, making this connection between the crib and Huxley's dystopia, right, where reproduction and child rearing were engineered and controlled by a techno-scientific authoritarian government. Most damning, perhaps, was the photo. 
that accompanied the article, the Skinner baby in the crib <laughs> with her hands and face pressed against the glass. The article actually helped foster an urban legend that Deborah Skinner, um, that being raised in the crib had caused her grave psychological trauma, that she'd gone mad, that she'd committed suicide. None of these are true. I was not a lab rat. She had to insist in an op-ed in The Guardian in 2004, but that's the story that still gets told about that device. That's the popular perception of what this piece of parenting technology might do deprive the child of love and socialization. The air crib, psychologist Lee Benjamin argues, was viewed at the time as a technology of displacement, right? a device that interferes with the usual modes of conduct for human beings, in this case, parent and child. It displaces the parent. It's a similar problem, Benjamin argues, to that faced by one of Skinner's other inventions the teaching machine that he came up with in 1953 when he visited Deborah's fourth grade classroom. Poor Deborah, bless her heart. Um, these technologies both failed to achieve widespread adoption because they were seen as subverting valuable human relationships, right? Relationships necessary to human development. Now, arguably, the most significant, in some circles, the most alarming parenting technology of the 20th century was neither the baby monitor nor the air crib, it was the television. Right? Children in post-war America were increasingly left alone while their parents were at work, some feared. Right? This was the story. Without adequate adult supervision, but with this piece of technology. Of course, children being left alone wasn't new, but white middle-class fears about unaccompanied minors were heightened for a number of reasons, connected to changing cultural expectations about women and work, as well as the sort of social construction of this dangerous new care uh, category of people called the youth. American children still watch a 19 hours a week for those aged 2 to 11 and much of it unsupervised. Um, but one of the promises of new screens, new parenting technologies, unlike the television, these can watch children back. Again, this marketing material from Mattel, the convenient Aristotle app lets you keep a close eye and ear on your baby from your smart device. Right? Computers, we can monitor the child makes through the microphone sounds the child makes through the microphone. You can monitor the movement makes if you stick a camera in there. You can monitor all activity, physical and digital, through computers' activity logs. You can monitor them wherever they go, even if you're not there, in their bedroom, in the classroom. These new parenting devices, I think, try very hard to convince us that they are not technologies of displacement. Rather, they're one of enhancement. They insist that they do not interfere with parental relationships, but extend them, ex enable them, extend their reach, right? even in a parent's absence. It's not a matter of replacing parents, but augmenting parenting with machines. Sterling University's Ben Williamson talks about Mattel's Aristotle. He says it's a smart, smart baby monitor that purports to be quote, the algorithmic solution to many parents' problems, the automated and loco parent is figure that possesses endless energy, requires no sleep, does the shopping, keeps the baby entertained and educated in ways that exceed human capacity. This argument should be quite familiar to us in ed tech. This is the story we hear and tell about many machines, right? about algorithmic systems like adaptive learning, predictive analytics, personalization, enhance, not replace. It's the story that B.F. Skinner told some 60 years ago about teaching machines. Will machines replace teachers? He said, on the contrary, quote, they are capital equipment to be used by teachers to save time and labor. In assigning certain mechanizable functions to machines, the teacher emerges in his proper role as an indispensable human being. He may teach more students than ever before. This is probably inevitable, Skinner said, if the worldwide demand for education is to be satisfied, that he will do so in fewer hours and with fewer 
burdensome chores. Chores, that's an interesting word choice, one that posits, I think, the work of the classroom alongside the work of the home. But it's not really clear in that passage what Skinner means when he says certain tasks are mechanizable, right? What are the mechanizable functions of education? What are not? Why would we mechanize something? In the case of Mattel, mechanizable functions, right, seem to include not just monitoring the sleeping child, alerting a parent to her cries, but playing with the child, comforting the child, teaching the child, talking to the child, singing to the child, reading to the child. Raising a story, or a child, this story from Mattel suggests can be mechanized. Interacting with a child can be mechanized. Caring for a child can be mechanized. That's quite an unsettling story. Das und Heimlich. Fast company. Fast company likes it. And perhaps if enough people tell that story often enough, they'll change the way we think. Right? They'll change the way we think about robots. They'll change the way we think about parenting. We think that baby monitors are necessary now. We've convinced ourselves of that. The marketing has. Indeed, last week I was on stage with someone from Singularity University, which is a Silicon Valley think tank funded by Ray Kurzweil. Um, and this person insisted that this was our future. We would all love and be loved by robots. We would be raised by robots. She cited Mattel's Aristotle as proof. We will be taught by robots. We will age and we will die with robot caretakers. But robots don't love. Robots don't care. They don't now. They never will, no matter the stories that futurists tell us. Quote, I think that robots will be able to act just like they are falling in love Google AI expert Peter Norvig said in 2013 in response to the Spike Jones movie, Her. But is being programmed to act like love the same as love? It's a philosophical question, sure. It's a political question, I think. It's a pedagogical question, right? And it's a question we have to ask. It's a question we have to ask, particularly as companies are trying to extend their reach right, with their products and their promises of thinking machines. How might programmatic, algorithmic, child-rearing technologies change our notions of love, of care, and of humanity? Right? How might they already be doing precisely that? through their design and their implementation, through the ways in which they incentivize certain activities, technologies shape and they reshape our practices and our relationships. They shape our imaginations and our technologies in turn are shaped by the imaginative stories we tell and we hear about it by our beliefs and our practices. Will a robot raise your child? Will a robot raise your grandchild? 60 years ago when B.F. Skinner was trying to convince families and schools to buy air cribs and teaching machines, the answer from parents and teachers was overwhelmingly no. But now, I'm, I'm not sure we are as resistant to the language of engineering and optimization, even in our most intimate spaces and relationships. And it's not that the technology is better, it's not. New technologies, I think the ideologies that underpin them, they've brought this language of efficiency and productivity out of the workplace and into the classroom, into the home, into the realm of reproductive labor. Everything has become a data point to be tracked and quantified and analyzed and adjusted as someone deems necessary. Everything must be perfectly observable, even when no human is there to watch. And so we have the quantified parent, the 
quantified baby, the quantified student, the quantified family, quantified bedroom, quantified bathroom, the quantified laundry room, the quantified kitchen, quantified feedings, quantified diaper changes, quantified nap times, quantified gurgles, quantified smiles, quantified word use, quantified play. Mattel has an app for quantified play. All of this will be facilitated by smart devices in our smart homes under the guise of engineering, and I do mean engineering smart children, right? New network systems that will optimize parenting and child development algorithmically. Or so we're told, right? It seems quite likely to me the ways in which a white child from an affluent two-parent family would experience these parenting and education technologies would be quite different from the way in which a brown child with a poor single mom would. There are no people of color in any of the images I use today. This science fiction imaginary, right? It is very white. Did you notice? Right. It's a brave new world, indeed. We're supposed to be really thrilled about this enhancement. Or so I gather from the marketing, right? The marketing for parenting and education technologies. That's what we're told by CES. I worry sometimes that that's what we're told by the Horizon Report. Somewhere along the way, we have confused surveillance for care. It's not necessarily a new or emergent phenomenon. Right? We can trace it back, at the very least, to the radio nurse, this compulsion to monitor our babies. This confusion, surveillance for care, has profound implications for how we raise children. Profound implications for how we teach and how we learn. It has profound implications for how we trust and how we respect one another. Right? Love and care and respect for one another. Yeah, I'm, an ideal, I'm an idealist, yeah. Uh, that must be the work of all humans. Look around now, and I hope we can recognize that. Love and respect and care, that is the work of parenting even for non-parents. That is the work of teaching. Love and care and respect for one another. And I truly hope, I truly, truly hope that we never convince ourselves we never convince ourselves of a story that tells us different. That we never convince ourselves that this can be or that this should be the work of a machine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I let you escape, do, do, do you have time for questions? Sure, I always try to not okay. leave time for questions. But damn it, I did. Okay. Yes, questions. Okay. All right, so they're scrambling in the back for microphones as you think about your questions. Um, stand up so we can find you with the mic. Hey there. Um, I share your skepticism. Uh, as a psychologist, I understand uh, the social dynamics and all the other factors that are important for quality life and education. Um, so I share that. I was wondering, what do you think would be the appropriate use of technology, right? It's not going to be all or nothing, but from your perspective, what do you see as how we should go forward? Like, oh, educational technology in this area, is, we should go there, but this other area, it's promising. So that's a great question. So I, I mean, I, for me, I think that sometimes when we focus on the technology, we're sort of automatically um, answering it with, uh, we sort of already answer the question with something that must be technological. Um, I think that there are, that to me, I, we should focus on, we should focus on relationships. Are there ways in which technology can enhance relationships? Perhaps, yes. I think that the, that the internet, the web, has shown us ways in which knowledge, scholarship, can be enhanced in powerful ways. But I think that, you know, but when we ask questions about technology, we get, we sort of, we sort of demand a technological answer. And I think that 
in many ways, what we need to think about right now is how can we return to these questions of the human, right? How can we, how can we address the crises that are happening in our institutions, the crises that are happening in our cities, the crises that are happening in our communities, the crises that are happening in our democracy, and those, to me, seem to be profoundly human questions. Those are questions about relationships. I'm not sure that they're necessarily questions about technology. When we talk about technology, too often, I guess, we talk about product and not practices. Right? So I'm interested in what are cultural practices, what are beliefs, what are stories. To, I think that when we talk about tech, we very quickly become, we talk about solutions and we talk about products. Uh, so, so I'm not even really sure how to phrase it. I mean, even just there, um, you know, we demand a tech, uh, a tech solution. I think that's that's the really hard part because what you point out is that it's kind of it's the capitalism and the marketing. It's not me demanding a solution. It's me being addicted to um, seeing the solutions and being part of the. And then that just gets tied into this loop and of everything that we're seeing. Um, you know, so so because we we do we how often do we in our lives talk about the the values and what we're really doing and where our sources of addiction are and and thing and things like that and um, so I, I think it's really that point and if you could say more about it that those changing definitions of the thing around things around us like love that it doesn't fit the definition now, but if we're not careful and we don't think about it and we don't have critical thinking, but then there's all th kinds of things working in our society to go against that because that's where our personal um, agency comes from and not everything around us wants us to have per personal agency. So it's just a, it's a really um, tangly knot that we have to resolve ourselves. And I, I guess I don't, I don't that's, the, that's the part that we have to be really mindful of ourselves and is how does that kind of come in? I mean, the changing definition, if you look at the pri at privacy and everything, we, we've seen definitions whew, of what we think is acceptable, and we see it with surveillance in the, it goes up to then the, the whole national level. So it's really scary. I don't know what my <laughs> question is, but well, it's so just, it's, all, it's so entangled in who we are, and entangled. things are not, but, so what do we do to help ourselves and to bond, to actually change love into uh, further down the other direction? So it's acceptable to talk about love in public and, and values and, and things like that. So can we actually use technology like the other way? Well, I guess so, that's open source stuff. <laughs> so I think that, um, I, I, I hear a lot of, um, justification for particular technological interventions and the language that we use around these some of these tools that get um, wielded by institutions by schools often has that sort of medical language to it so that we're gonna we're gonna intervene we're gonna do this intervention again which uh, the sort of strange sort of language this particular language that we use that immediately puts students in, in a certain category, right? To do an intervention on a student comes laden with all of these other cultural assumptions, set of practices, beliefs, and what it means to sort of interpolate the student as a certain kind of person. Um, and so I think that when we talk about something like predictive analytics, which I think are done in a similar kind of way, like we say, well, we care about students. We want them to graduate. We want them to do well. So we're going to make sure that we're monitoring every single click that they make in the piece of technology I really didn't want to talk about, right? So like, I think that we, just, we justify a lot of the things, the practices, the technological things that we're doing um, because we're not doing the things that the students sat on stage and said, what was the one thing I could do? And they said, be a human with me, listen to me learn about me, look me in the eye, get to know me as a person. And if you get to know another person, you don't actually need to know how many times they clicked into Blackboard to know that they're struggling, right? Because you, you know them as a, human, as a human being. They're not just sort of like this aggregation of data points 
that then you run algorithmically and say, well, you're just a yellow light today, so we're not going to intervene. But once you slip into the red, then we have this whole series of, of practices that we want to do. So I think that, you know, how do we make our institutions love each other better? Oh, man. That's a lot. I mean, I think that that's, that's the question I think we all have to grapple with. Um, I mean, I think we have to, that's the question we have to grapple with um, at, an, at an institutional level. That's the question we have to grapple with. Um, I don't mean to exclude any non-Americans right now, but that's some shit we need to get together, like pull ourselves together with right now as a country. I mean, we are unable to, we are unable to sit and talk and, and, and um, interact with, with one another. And I think that we have to figure out ways we have to figure out ways that are not actually, you know, surveilling one another and sort of identifying devi identifying deviance, whatever deviance looks like, um, in order to sort of signal that someone has sort of fallen out of step. We we just need to become. Well, we should probably all be English majors, and sociologists. <laughs> <laughs> No, not philosophy. Far too quickly, you seem to become venture capitalists. Not you. Yes. Um, I totally um, feel what you're saying. Uh, but I find sometimes, so for, I just want to give you a little background from what I did and where I feel like I couldn't, there's only certain, uh, there's only so much that I could could have done. So for ex um, my first job was, or my first educational job where I was teaching, we were saving um, the most difficult concepts to work with the students in the classroom. So that was the, the and we would take all the skills that they, so anything that they would get frustrated with, they would do with us in the classroom and we would get to know them that way. And then anything that was easy um, or that we just wanted them to sharpen their skills on that they wouldn't get frustrated with, we put it into kind of a tech um, system where feedback was automated and things like that. Um, and so then I went, my next job, and I wasn't handling that many students, and so then I went to my next job where I was teaching 120 students a week. And it just kept going up. It started with like 100 or 90, and it just kept going up. And you, and you can imagine how many parents that was, because that was K through 12. And um, even though I did my best to really get to know each student and to really know who they were and to understand that they had their we also did the green, the, the yellow, the red. And, and you know, <clears throat> I found that without a way, to, like a tool to help me, I just couldn't remember all of their things. Like, I, you know, I would talk to so many students a week. I would talk to them after class. I would talk to their parents. I would get so involved. I would email. I would do, you know, everything I could. But at the end of the day, it just wasn't enough. Like, my best just wasn't enough. And I needed a tool to support me in, um, you know, uh, collecting things about them, which, and particularly the kids that were in red, if I could particularly point to something that they did well, it was really also helpful to track just because it helped boost their confidence because I could find where they did well and I could be like, see, you can do a good job. Let's see how we can um, translate that. So I just find it so interesting because um, I also thought, I used to teach writing and also a lot of grading, just a lot of grading and I used to think, oh, it would be so great if there was an automated grader that would grade this paragraph for me and, and identify whether there's enough elaboration or the topic sentence is good or something like that. And, um, and then I started thinking, well, when I was writing, what does it mean to have an audience that's the computer? And when I was writing, I really loved having that live audience where you know somebody would maybe be impressed or not impressed or have some kind of real feedback um, and connect to what I was saying. And in a com and in a virtual environment where you you know you might like plan your feedback ahead of time or something like that, um, I realized that people who 
uh, if a student is writing something and they know that it's going to get graded automatically by some kind of program, I wonder how that's going to change the quality of their work. And I'm sure it's going to change it tremendously because you know, part of it is connecting with your teacher or with your audience. That's a huge part of, um, part of it. So I just wonder because um, it's so hard to balance the two. And even, even when I do try to put all my care and love into my students, like I said, it's not enough. And I wonder how to think about it. I, I, I like to think about technology as a way to support certain skills and you know, save the hard stuff for the instructors. But I don't know. It seems like we're replacing instructors a lot with technology. And I'm not sure exactly you know, how to balance all of that. So I think that there, I mean, for me that this is, uh, I think that this is, to me this is a question in many ways of, of equity, right? Um, so I think that the situations in which students are likely to have small classrooms with individual attention and high touch, um, high touch settings, in some ways it's sort of like the opposite of what Aristotle, Aristotle is sort of very much the sort of $350 magical uh, algorithmic parenting device is, is this strange middle class sort of um, consumer product that's selling something. But really, like the more affluent you are, likely, in, in, in American schools, you're likely to be in a smaller class where you have a high touch, human touch setting, less, much less likely to have technological, um, sort of these sort of t technological o over um, programs, right? So, you know, so we can see this as sort of being, like, as funding, like, as we struggle for funding for schools, as more and more students are in classes, as teachers and teacher's assistants have a greater and greater burden, um, using these things to automate, like what, what Skinner said, right? Using these things to automate, to mechanize certain tasks becomes quite appealing and in some ways sort of logical for the system as is. I think that there are some things that we can think about, right? What are, what are the things that we're asking students to do? When you were talking about writing, you said that you like to have an audience, you like to think of an audience. I mean, there's something about writing, particularly when you write publicly or when you write online and particularly post it on the web, it feels like it's somehow more real, right? It feels, I, I'm hesitant to use the word authentic, but it does feel as though there is something more authentic about it. You're actually asking students to do meaningful work that lives, in, that lives on the web as an exemplary of scholarship. It recognizes them as scholars, as contributors, as builders of knowledge in, an, in, an in a large educational enterprise. And this isn't something just for, college, for graduate students or college students. I mean, this is something that absolutely K through 12 Students can absolutely be scholars. I mean, they, they can be scholars. Um, they can participate in scholarly community doing meaningful work. But we spend a lot of time in school, in K through 12, and in college, and in graduate school even, doing a lot of ridiculous tasks that are throwaway nothing assignments, right? That are meaningless, empty, busy work. Right? And so instead of automating the grading of busy work, perhaps we might think about ways in which we can restructure the work, the work, because we are asking students to do work. We call it school work. We send it home with them. It's homework. We work, ask them to work for free. Now we ask them to work for free on these other technology platforms, right, where their data sort of enhances the algorithms of these, of these companies. But why don't we rethink the kinds of things that we're asking students to do? Why don't we ask them to do meaningful work together in which they're responsible amongst their peers, their fellow scholars as peers and perhaps their peers online, and not just asking them to do worksheets. It's not an answer. I mean, the answer is like fun schools. Billionaires have to pay like 98% of their money Right. Mark Zuckerberg's going to be fine if we take 98% of his money, if we radically re redistribute wealth. These things are good. <laughs> They'll fix a lot of it, actually. Right. Um, and then, you know, as the sort of the future with robots taking our jobs, if we find spaces for hum hum more humans to do 
human work with other humans in meaningful ways. And teaching is meaningful work. Right? Teaching and learning are meaningful, profoundly meaningful work. Why the hell would we automate parenting, teaching, and learning? Those are profoundly, profoundly emotional work. When you strip, when you strip the emotion from it, like you said in the case of writing for a robot, it's not meaningful, it's insulting. And it's insulting that we ask students to, it's insulting that we ask students to do this work. And it's insulting that we tell teachers that they can be replaced by these machines. And it's really insulting to suggest that parenting is something that you can pick up your app, right, to know when it's time to love your baby. Sorry, I got a little ranty there, sorry. Well, on that happy note, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate uh, your talk today because we started the whole conference um, with Richard Collada and he helped us think about uh, evaluating education with a unit of analysis being the student. And so that was a very humanistic approach to education. And I feel like we ended the conference with uh, not only a humanistic approach to education, but a humanistic approach to humanity. So thank you. Thanks. Do you want me to take this? I'll just take it.